Right, okay. Well, first of all, good evening, and thanks very much for having me this evening. Um, this is to build really into the low-rise side of things that Steve was talking to you about. Um, I think during the end of the session, there was an awful lot of people that, that would benefit from this. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, my name's Andy Crooks. Um, I've been with JHA now for around about 12 years or so. Um, my background is as a, um, I was 17 years in local government, so I'm familiar with the local authority side of things. And for around about the past 12 years or so, I've been with JHAI. I'm responsible for its service offerings, whether it's within fire engineering or building control or access or whatever, whatever areas that you might venture into. Um, my particular interest is in fire engineering. And one thing that we have done within JHA is that we've, we've reflected quite heavily on our commercial experience and started to reflect on how it actually affects design within the domestic environment. And one thing we discovered was there was a huge misunderstanding about regulatory compliance really within domestic. So hopefully we can, we can um, illustrate what we're actually talking about today. So we're here today to talk less about the regulatory control within domestic situations. After all, most of you have been within, you know, dealing with it for the most of your careers. Everybody, everybody cuts their teeth on the domestics. Today's session is more to look at the freedoms that exist within the regulatory framework, which allow you to maximize design freedom. So uh, the aim of today is to facilitate um, to provide you a little bit more insight into some of the issues you can see before you put pen to paper and make sure that your clients are absolutely aware of them. Uh, my session will draw heavily on your interaction, so please don't be afraid to get involved. Uh, there are no stupid answers. Um, the idea of today is to challenge some of our preconceptions about the clients and make sure that we get we enhance our understanding of what we actually create in the domestic environment. So just please get involved. It, it really does rely on you shouting out and feel free to do so at any time. So my background is, um, as I say, I, I'm a chartered surveyor, I'm a chartered building engineer and fire engineer. And um, JHA as an organization, uh, when I first came into it, I think we were about 30 strong. And there's now about 150 of us stomping around the country. We, if you, if you ever need the service, then please give me a call. My contact details are on the screen and I'll forward this across to Mick and Josh later on so they can circulate it. Whilst the video will be um, available, won't it? Andy, so, you, you mentioned something that was on the screen. You're not currently sharing um, anything. Oh, am I not? Oh, no, I do apologise. Right, let me try and correct that. Um, dear me, right, where are we? Can you see now? It looks good. Yep. Thank um, goodness for that. Well, my contact details are on the screen. They're in front of you. Oh, no, technical no. glitch. It's no. on your presenter screen as opposed to the kind of full screen. I will unshare and do me thing again. Bear with me a second. The old two screen issue as we faced for the last year. <laughs> I know. That's the thing, isn't it? You'd have thought I'd have got used to it by now. But um, this is where I go into panic stage. Right, there we go. Hopefully, you've got a clean screen. Looks good. Can I just ask, if anybody has any accessibility issues, would they like me to put a commentary of this up as we actually present? Apparently, there's some voice recognition. I, I have no idea what it'll do with my voice, but if you would prefer me not to do it, I would much prefer that. Um, so, would, does anybody have any particular preference? If you do, just drop it in the chat and we can enable it, I suppose. Yeah, I can I can do it just at the click of a button. So that, that's fine. Right, I'm going to move you back over here so I can see everybody. And then I'll make a start. Right, so what we're actually going to run to, through today is to just to introduce you to the issues. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about your expertise and, and where you actually sort of reside. So. 
um, it, it, uh, 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 is, does everybody get involved with domestic design? And if so, just just what sort of properties you actually deal with? Just a smattering of examples. Sarah, would you kindly start us off? You're the one brave enough to show your video. <laughs> and then, Jamie, I was going to ask you as well, because I noticed you're in. <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, my name is Sarah. I work uh, for um, Alan Joyce Architects. Um, and we do a lot of residential, and I get involved a lot uh, with um, uh, single houses, um, lots of extensions, barn conversions, that sort of thing. Brilliant. That this this will serve you particularly well, then, Sarah. Thanks for sharing. Brilliant, <laughs> Jamie. Uh, I'm going to say ditto. Okay, <laughs> that's good enough. That's fine. Um, some large scale residential flats and I would step into the realms of student accommodation, but uh, in terms of resi, apartments, new builds, conversions, refurbs, extensions, everything. Okay. I mean, effectively, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be concentrating on the aspects of domestic, but if you do have any commercial questions, then just fire away. Um, hopefully, I can get the get the, the the memory working at this time of the evening when I've been working since six o'clock this morning, but never mind. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, what we're actually going to do is apprise you of some of the issues. And we're going to allow you to be able to uh, learn a little bit more about the options to be escape in case of fire and just give you a few solutions that can actually help. Um, very often we're, we're asked about whether or not protected stairways are always needed, to what extent is protection always needed, protection needed. And, and there's a massive drive, particularly with architects, for the spatial experiences and what have you. So hopefully we'll leave you today with a little bit more um, options for creativity within your spaces to actually provide your clients with exactly what they actually want. Um, the, the regulations themselves are functional, which means that they're goal-based. The regulations themselves are scheduled to be, or the technical requirements of the regulations, are scheduled within a very thin document that, that appends the building regulations. And they run through from part A through to, through to um, uh, what will soon be S from um, April next year. And, and the requirement for B1, which is means of escape in case of fire, literally just says that a person should be able to be provided with early warning to facilitate safe means of escape to um, a safe place outside the building paraphrasing slightly, but, but that's basically the requirement for means of escape. And then what we actually end up with is a fleet of documents that, that sit underneath and they tend to inform our technical practices. But you can do other things. There's lots and lots of different ways to approach domestic design. Uh, there's lots of technologies around which you can draw and um, that you can draw from to be able to um, make sure that you, you create safe environments. But when you are facilitating this, it's pretty essential that you pass that information on to your clients. So the first sort of question I'm going to ask really is, why bother? It's, it's pretty rare, isn't it? Does, does anybody have any idea how many fires we actually see within buildings per year within the domestic environment? Um, um, but actually, before we get into that, how many, how many deaths do we see within commercial property every single year? I think the figures will probably be skewed, won't they, with the recent history, but I'm sure the number is greater than I think. <laughs> well, how many would you suggest in, in commercial property, Mike, Mick? Uh, a couple of thousand, maybe? A year? Yeah. In, in commercial property, it's around about 15 or so per year. Right, okay. And, and by comparison to domestics, how many would you assume that were, um, were seeing meet their end in domestic environments per year? Uh, I would probably say half that, maybe a thousand. Um, in actual fact, it's only a couple of hundred. Right. So it, it, it's quite a, it's quite a, I mean, we, we, we look at this burning issue, if you'll excuse me, and, and assume that it's a lot worse than it is. But the chances of actually getting a fire within a domestic property, which is a fatality, is relatively rare. 
and, and Mick is quite right, the, the figures are quite skewed. But you'll notice within the last 20 years or so, the deaths in properties have actually halved um, down from around about 450 in 2002. And if you looked at 1920, the deaths have actually come down from around about 2000 a year. But what did we do in the olden days that we don't do as much of now? Technology, would technology have advanced it? You know, door sets and things like that. Um, it, it certainly has an impact. Yeah, <laughs> anybody else? Open cooking, open fires. Yeah, open fires is a biggie, absolutely. What did 85% of people do in 1920 that they don't, that only 15% of people do now? Would be smoking, presumably. Absolutely, Josh, absolutely. So as a result of that, um, we have better detection systems that have been introduced, even if they're just battery operated. It, it certainly provides early warning to people inside of these environments. And obviously we've seen an increasing amount of buildings uh, requiring smoke detection and what have you. Um, I could just open my chat window. And, and absolutely, um, Paul's just made sure he mentioned better detection. And uh, yeah, and, and Mick said that he's nailed it. He's absolutely right. This isn't a test, by the way. It's just to sort of challenge some of the preconceptions of what have you been going to occur. But yeah, better detection and changing habits. And obviously, you know, an awful lot of people used to literally just, just die in their sleep. So we're, we're obviously seeing, um, you know, people, less people smoking in bed. It's more socially acceptable if we get out of the house these days. And, um, and those social habits are, are very, very, very much changing. So, yeah, and it's had a huge impact on the amount of deaths uh, that we see every single year. So what are, what are the issues that can improve design freedom? Um, First of all, I want to increase your awareness of, of several issues. And I want you to have a look at the how severe a, a building fire can, uh, sorry, a domestic fire can actually get. And I want to look at the principal differences between uh, how people behave within commercial buildings and, and domestic buildings and look at the different challenges and actually find out a little bit more for yourselves about how you actually escape from your property, having regard to the occupants with whom you live. So we, we wanna have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So to open this discussion up, as I said, it's highly interactive. Um, what's your escape plan? How are you gonna be able to get out of your property? What, what do you do um, to actually uh, facilitate your own means of escape? Sarah, I'm gonna pick on you again. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably, the front door. Yeah, yeah. I, do you know what? I remember doing some, I remember doing a talk in Nottingham University. I'm actually based out in Bath and I, and I went to an RICS conference many moons ago. And the, the, uh, there used to be a piece of RIBA research, which was called One Man and His Parrot, which was undertaken in a residential car home where literally this lady actually picked up her parrot and walked straight out the front door when she actually lived right next to a fire exit. And I remember somebody thought it would be hysterically funny when I was lecturing this group of APC students for RICS uh, on fire safety, just in preparation for their final exam. And somebody set the fire alarm off. And um, literally the, the people that evacuated behind me through the nearest exit, number four, and, and they ended up with 350 people walking through an atrium on that alarm. And only, only around about probably 50 or 60 people actually went through fire exits. And if we can't get it right, what chance does the public stand? We've got to make it more intuitive. So the front door isn't an unreasonable place. What else could you do? So if you were trapped within an open plan fire, do you have children, Sarah, as well? No. OK, what I want you to imagine is that if you did, how on earth would you get them out of a code compliant building? Does anybody want to chip in who's got kids? Because you must have practiced this with your children, children. I mean, I'm, we don't have an open plan house, but we have uh, we have a scenario where if we can't get down, we live in a, a two storey, well, three storey Barrett townhouse. Mm -hmm. So if we can't get to the ground floor, the plan is to throw the mattresses out the back window 
and then lower them down onto those. How, how would you do that? By, well, one of us, one of the grown ups would have to go out first and hopefully catch them, kind of thing. Yeah, but okay. if it's out of a first floor window, I've got a photograph of a first floor window with somebody yeah. hanging out of it uh, later, you know. I mean, if it's under four and a half meters, yeah, we're yeah. said to be able to use that as a almost like a safe means of escape. I think this is one of the misconceptions that we've actually got. Yeah. The, the escape windows are actually designed not to uh, to rescue somebody. From. Yeah. So if you're going to put your, how on earth are you going to lower your child down four and a half meters without them breaking? Or if mm. you're going to leap out first, how are you going to stop yourself from breaking? Hopefully so, <laughs> but, but this is what we find with architectural practices, um, particularly that that we tend to be very tunnel vision. I'm glad that you mentioned the mattress because that's obviously going to soften your landing at the very least. Um, but but how are you going to get your kids out safely if that escape route is blocked? Anybody could offer any insight on that? I think. One of the one of the um, elements of the house that that I currently live in is that when they redid the back house, the windows at the back of the house, in you know in glorious PVC, um, is that they added they they allowed the bottom element of the the one of the bedroom windows to be openable as well as the top one, which allowed you access at least temporarily onto the kind of uh, uh, scullery extension roof, which would allow you to then get out and, and this does this allows for at least a nominal kind of uh, secondary route of escape depending on, on where the fire is um, but you would still have to jump at least three meters um, but you might make the grass rather than the stonework. So it begs the question how we get those out that we're actually responsible for. You know, how, how are you going to be able to take a babe in arms? I like Mick's idea of lowering them out the window, but it's what you use. Are there anything available in, a, in, a, in your bedroom if you train your kids towards you or um, that, that effectively you can utilise that don't form part of the building features? Well, I suppose it would be like your prison escape plan, wouldn't it? You'd tie your bed sheets together. You could do, but putting a baby out on a bed sheet, I don't know whether I'd quite dare to do yeah. that. Yeah. It, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we don't necessarily think about these things. Um, I, I, I'll tell you what I would do. I would put them in the massive pocket that sits in her bed. I would, I would throw the mattress out the window. I would pop the child into the duvet, uh, which is like a massive pocket, which will actually allow me then to lower the person down onto the, onto the ground uh, to, to give them a better... Uh, soft landing you know you you can wiggle them out the window but if it is an open plan arrangement you know that that you, you may need to swing them away from the building as well because you know fires are hot and they radiate through the majority of our glass so it isn't necessarily going to be straightforward if they're very very young and what I tend to find is that people when we're designing buildings are so used to looking at approved document clients we assume that the regulations actually have all the answers so when you're actually thinking about your own situations at home, it's really quite useful to think of it pragmatically and actually get your family to, to, to practice their means of escape and to do it blindfolded so they know how to get to you. Now, this might sound absolutely ridiculous, but, you know, the, the, the three tenability conditions that fire engineers consider, generally speaking, are the heat of the fire. And you can't move through anything above 150 degrees C for any more than around about three meters or so without literally collapsing. And um, you obviously have the toxicity of the smoke and you obviously have the visibility. Not all fires that we see within the domestic environment are, you know, similar to those that we see on London burning or some of these sort of United States sort of, you know, fire brigade programs that are all heroic. Everything is, is more or less smoke free. So we, we tend to have a number of preconceptions about this. So what I want to explore next is just how long we actually have to escape from a domestic fire. So I'd like you to put in the chat window, if you possibly could, just how long you think you have to get out of your average. Um, if you imagine a fire starting within your living room, how long do you actually have for those tenability conditions to become exceeded? 
please feel free to chat away or shout out. I was going to type it in, but I suppose for me, it would depend if myself or my wife or my children have shut the fire doors on the final escape route. You know, we, we pass our kitchen to the to get to the front door, but we don't mm -hmm. have to pass it for the back door. So if the doors are shut, I would have thought 15 to 20 minutes, maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any advance on that? Any, any, because I mean, we, you know, let's assume that we're working within a three story environment and we have the doors actually closed. Um, or you may well be within an open plan environment that you've just created. How long do you have then? And, and Paul's made a very pertinent point there that three lungfuls of smoke, if you're lucky. So, you know, we pop half hour doors on our, on our enclosures, don't we? Or no fire doors at all. And, um, you know, how long do we have then? 10 minutes? I don't know, because I'm a bit biased, because I saw that video the other night that you showed us, and that, that kicked off quite quick. <laughs> so I'd imagine yeah. it's seconds, really. It, 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 it absolutely is. And um, um, let's just have a look at this environment. So what I want you to do, I'm, I'm going to put a video up in just a second. And um, I'm going to have to tell you a little bit about it before we actually get there, because it's a very, very quick fire, as Mix alluded to. So I want you to imagine how long you actually have for around about a month a year when we see an awful lot of the public putting real Christmas trees into the, into the environment. And, and these really do pose a huge fire load. B&Q's Christmas trees are generally speaking harvested from all over the place and they start to harvest them around about September. And it, you'll, you'll diminish some of the uh, combustibility by popping it in a bucket of water and what have you. Uh, but, but generally speaking, it's going to be pretty tender dry. Um, I want you to imagine how much control over the people that you have that are maybe within this particular enclosure. And I'll, I'll basically explain this as we actually go. Um, what I want to do is, is look at the, the timing of the fire and pick up on the tenability limits and just explain how the fire actually develops within the enclosure. And what I'd really like to ask you after we see the video is um, I want you to consider the effects of a sprinkler because these are um, these are seen as lifesavers. So I'd like you to speculate on what would have happened if you'd actually had a sprinkler within this particular enclosure. And, and I want to emphasize the importance of structural separation after we actually look at it. So this is a video of a Christmas tree fire, which has been knocked up by NIST. Um, and for the keen gardeners amongst you, uh, I'm aware that it's a Scots pine, but it's actually an American video. So they've called it a Scots pine. So um, what we have here is a mock-up fire, which starts at the base of the Christmas tree. And there's a count. So you'll see the fire. If you're sat in this chair, your tenability conditions to be able to move are around about now. When the temperature in that chair exceeds 150 degrees and it becomes impossible for you to actually get up, you'll see that this very blackened smoke layer is radiating towards the floor. And around about now, you'll start to see smoke and fumes lifting up from the floor when everything becomes involved in the fire. And that's the limit at which you could actually crawl through the enclosure is around about 25 seconds. So if you did have a loved one lying asleep on that living room couch, you have around about seven seconds to move and make sure they're moving with you, which I always find a little bit shocking when I actually see that. And as Paul suggests, you're right, around about you know a good lung full of smoke will in that environment purely kill you. But we can't see anything, you know? So the, the speed of that, the speed of that fire is truly, truly astounding. So what I'd like you to do now is just discuss how long do we actually have within the open plan environment, unless we're actually passing on better advice to people and building in some structural separation. It isn't 10 minutes, is it? It isn't 15 minutes. It's extremely, extremely quick. And that assumes, as Mick pointed out, that the doors onto that enclosure are actually closed. And remember that the flashover will go to the highest point and will start radiating down from that. So what I really want to ask is, what do you think the effects of a sprinkler headed this group will be? 
certainly, um, I would have thought, add a level of control and reduce the chance of a fire. Yeah, what does everybody else think? Yeah, I'm thinking the same. I'm thinking that we'll stop it on its tracks. Yeah. Okay. What happens to water when it hits a um, hundred degrees C? Boils. And and it hit 150 degrees C within seven seconds, didn't it? So what I'm suggesting is that the sprinkler head in that particular situation would become completely, completely overwhelmed, extremely fast. And and it would add virtually no value to it and shortly after that you're going to get structural damage which would end up with the pipes melting which would just put a gentle drip of water onto it what we've seen is when we look at some of the misting systems a little bit later on um auto mist have a system which isn't yet it, they, they have a system where they use a uh, a radiation sensor which actually uh, sits next to the um misting head and actually sprays uh, sprays a, a larger volume of water or a larger volume, uh, a volumetric um, droplet, or, you know, it's a very, very fine mist. There's much more that can actually take the toxicity out of the fire that can actually, um, that can actually have the ability to scrub. And in actual fact, if you look on YouTube on the channel, um, you'll see that they're actually boasting putting out Christmas tree fires if they actually direct it onto it. But the first thing I would suggest to your client base is, for God's sake, if you're creating an open plan environment, do not put a natural Christmas tree in it. It's, it's get a decent fake. And, and that's what I would honestly say. So um, this, this kind of emphasizes the, the structural fire protection and make sure that, that you know, it's important that you protect those escape routes. What the approved document actually says is to allow um, structural fire protection within the dwelling, that it should be physically separated within a three property at either ground or first floor level to allow you to safely uh, get to a means of egress window from which you can be rescued, or you can make your own choices and use the duvet method to lower your kids down and what have you. But these are the things that we don't necessarily think of. And because we hear sprinklers being uh, upheld as the panacea for virtually everything at every opportunity, and they certainly are the only thing that have the capability for a slow growing fire within the say, if you're within the same enclosure of actually saving your life. You know, when you look at the design for residential car units, it will actually allow multi-occupants, multi-occupied rooms. In other words, you can have husband and husband and wife teams in there together actually occupying the residential car if there's a sprinkler. So it's um, it's something which will increase design freedom, um, but it won't necessarily be the answer to everything. So the type of system that you use becomes extremely important. And so, can I ask a question? Of course, you can. So. In in domestic scenarios, often, usually in the kitchen, you'd have a fire extinguisher or a fire blanket. You know, I remember when I was at school, the summer fair, we'd have the local fire team that would come and they would demonstrate a chip pan fire in the back and they'd put it out and everyone would be amazed. But I did see, and some others may have seen this recently, that Samsung had developed a fire vase. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, it, it kind of, you know, it's basically a fire extinguisher from what I understand, if you can throw well. Yeah, I, I, I don't know whether I'd want to chance it myself, because there's always a chance that you're going to hit the side of a chip pan. I mean, thankfully, we don't get too many chip pans these days. Yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, what we've also seen as well is that we've seen the design of the Pubis system that we'll have a look at. You know, this thing that's at the top of the pan. And, um, you know, that, that won an innovation award because it was a Dyson innovation award when it was first introduced by Plumis back in the day. There are systems that are available that will actually have a, um, a quenching effect, you know, a smothering effect on the fire. That tends to be the advantage of this systems over sprinklers. Sprinklers literally just to use the deflector plate to put large droplets of water and we'll see how they actually work a little bit later on. So effectively, you know, th this is the you know, the, the, the misting system is a lot more directional and, and the auto mist system, which uses the infrared, actually switches the, the head, which is mounted on the wall, towards the actual fire. And um, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more in a, in a few minutes. But yeah, I, I, I don't know whether I quite fancy that. I've also seen them 
escaping through shoots of you, you know, from 11 storey buildings and what have you. Yeah. Could I, could I jump through that? I really don't think I could. I just don't think I'd have the confidence. But there you go. So, um, as I say, whenever you, whenever you design a building, do make sure that you're chatting it through with somebody with a little bit more sort of understanding about the behavior of people inside buildings. And uh, if you're going to do this, make sure that you pass on the information, the design assumptions, very, very much in the same ilk as you would do from, um, you know, the, the, the normal um, Regulation 38 information that, you know, this fire safety information that you pass on to the responsible person. There's nothing wrong with doing it inside of a domestic environment either. As long as your insurance actually allows you to do it, that is, because I know that everybody comes with the insurance that but it, you know, these aren't these aren't. If I was having a group of um, you know school children, I can guarantee that they would probably come up with more imaginative solutions than than we would to fire. You know, we've got to start learning to think out the box. I think and be less reliant on the approved documents because they don't necessarily uh, answer us everything. So we have the means of egress window within approved document B that um, that tells us that. You know, we've got a uh, an escape window with a sill height of 1100 millimeters maximum. So we have to facilitate the uh, means of egress windows in, in buildings up to four and a half meters in, in floor area, in floor height, which means that we've probably got a sill height roughly of around about 5.3 meters, which you can see, you know, lowering yourself out of that window as, as Mick intends to do. It, it's going to potentially be quite damaging and a bit scary. Um, and, and so it, is it really for escape? Well, the intention was that the, you know, you, to, to meet the criteria in approved document B, that it should be accessible to the ladder. And um, the means of escape window will allow you to leap like a gazelle up onto the um, sill and then, and then pop just out the window. And, and we still hear these things actually referred to as means of escape windows all the time. I see it written on drawings all the time. They're not. They're really means of egress windows. They're intended for assisted rescue via ladders, probably from the fire brigade. But the, the fire may well overwhelm us quicker than that. And we need to be able to think out the box to be able to get out quickly. So, um, and, and the removal of self-closing devices from that enclosure back in 2006. So what we ended up with back in 2006 was a review of the domestic means of escape guide that is approved document B when they removed the need to have positive self-closing devices. And we saw an upgrade to FD20 doors um, on the staircase enclosure within existing dwellings. And, um, you know, but, but, but they're not necessarily closed. And, and educating those that were designing for to actually close those doors, particularly during sleeping risk hours, it, it's going to be a it's going to be a big thing. We, I've also put a, a, a Velux roof light in there where uh, you can see a fireman trying to rescue somebody. Um, in actual fact, that was a mock-up because back in the consultation phase of the approved document B in 2006, they asked the fire service just how many people they'd actually ever rescued from a a second floor Velux. Um, and the answer came back with a resounding zero. And yet we'd been particularly um, careful to ask for, you know, the maximum 1.7 and 800 millimeter sill height down facilitated in every single loft conversion that we asked for. Now they favor the means of escape enclosure with the FD20 doors sat in them. And, um, just, just to sort of ask, is anybody aware as to what an FD20 door actually is and how long it lasts in a fire? Well, by, by the name, um, I, I would assume it's a 20 minute fire door. Um, yeah. But you, your second question would probably mean it only lasts actually about 10 minutes. Well, is it a an FD30 without, you know, the frame, the intermessent strips, all that kind of stuff. So it's not a package, it's literally just the door. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I understand an FD20 to be. I, I think you're right, Carlos. Absolutely. And, and I, I think it's good. But how long can we expect that 20-minute door to last? I mean, basically, an FD20 door 
is actually a half hour fire door which sits within a frame which will likely last for 20 minutes it's actually in, in in when when I were a lad and I learned means of escape in case of fire, they used to make it nice and easy for us to recognise what it actually meant. The a fire door is it, within the lab. It's it's measured to achieve half hour structural integrity. In other words, it will stay in place. And the second figure, the twenty thing, is actually how long it will take for the smoke to pass through the enclosure. Okay. So, so effectively, it allows some smoke leakage onto the, through the door after 20 minutes, and that's what measured in the lab. So it begs the question: um, How long does a half-hour fire door actually last? Twenty minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's have a look at that in a few minutes. That's that's fine. It lasts yeah. 20 minutes in a lab. Yeah. That you know, under test conditions. But depending on what's burning behind it, it yeah. you know, if you're living in the, you remember the series The Life of Grime, and there was a guy on there called Mr. Trickett. He had literally hordes of stuff. That fire door probably isn't even closed. And if it was, it would probably last a few minutes, let alone half an hour that it was probably intended to do. So it, it very much depends on what's burning behind it and how quickly it's going up. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we don't all live in sort of perfect environments, do we? In which we, we kind of, in my office, the bits that you can't see, it's generally speaking a mess. Um, but there you go. So now I want to have a look a little bit more about the behaviour of fire. So how would you expect people to react in a fire? Um, can you sum it up in one word? Clean language. Um, uh, you, you'd panic, wouldn't you? You'd, uh, it would take you a good kind of 10, 20 seconds to actually realise what's going on and engage brain. Okay. It's an interesting one, yeah. And, and it's whether or not it depends on the signals that we actually give to confirm its presence. You know, if you think about the difference between the commercial environment the domestic environment, we're given very much different instructions depending on where we actually are. And obviously we sleep within the domestic environment. So the way that we behave, we tend to sort of go back to our base instinct, don't we, to protect those that we actually live within, or that we live with. And, uh, and we can react quite strangely. Does anybody have an alternative view as to whether or not they, you believe that we panic? Actually, Paul has just raised a very good point. He said there are studies that say that people don't tend to panic. Um, and I would tend to agree. I mean, the, there was a very public, um, the, there was a very public example of this back in, in 2001 on 9-11, when the Twin Towers came down. Did the people that leaped from, leapt from the windows to their death actually panic during the fire? And there is a fair amount of evidence to suggest that they probably didn't. You know, they were ringing up their loved ones. They were saying goodbye quite calmly, quite rationally. And, and they just chose to, to, to go the way that they, that they wanted to go. So um, you could say that they acted a little uh, less rationally, but people don't necessarily behave the way that you actually think that they should. So I think it's important if we look at an example, um, an example of where, you know, a commercial fire actually takes place. Now, I've got to mute this video, but I will try and commentate as we actually go. So I'm going to turn the sound off and hopefully I'm going to start it. It's a very grainy video because it's from a CCTV. Um, and I can't tell you where it is because threshers in Kirby, Liverpool would probably end up suing me. So, so what we have here is a, is a loft license environment. And you'll notice there's a lady here who's waiting to pay for something and you'll see a pair of lads walking who are actually looking for an opportunity to rob the place. So this guy walks up and you'll notice that the guy behind him has just lit a piece of paper and he actually throws it into a display of crisps, okay? So he's, uh, this guy's looking for an opportunity to, uh, to steal something from behind the shelf thinking that this will be a distraction, but the shopkeeper's not noticed. Look at this girl here. She actually looks behind and she probably sees the fire actually developing and she doesn't panic. And, and the fire's now growing. 
we see another guy walk in here and he slows down and he looks at the fire and then he goes and stands in the queue. So he's not panicking and he still hasn't yet told anybody. The young lads think better of it because they're not getting the opportunity that they want and they walk away. The shopkeeper hasn't yet noticed. This lady's getting a little bit over eager. She goes out the back to pick something up. And then the chap uh, actually builds the confidence that this the lady in front of him that there is a fire. And she then turns around and says, did you know there was a fire there? But we tend to be pre-programmed to actually sort of complete the task that we're actually working on. At this point, a young child walks in with the family and holds hands together and actually watches it develop. And you can see the flames visibly now up at the top of the image. And, and, but they actually come back in maybe to toast some chestnuts or something, I don't know. But, uh, you know, they're not going into blind panic. And these two guys, they're still in the queue. We have a lady here, watch the left-hand side of the picture. She lets the CO2 extinguisher off into her face, so a highly trained individual, and then proceeds to fan the flames with it. We have the guy who walked in afterwards, the timid one, but she's still waiting to pay for her fags. You know, and, and this is what we're actually putting up with. So um, we, we see two people here. The, the woman isn't trained enough to tell everybody to evacuate. One guy goes off around the back. Uh, so he's actually walking past the risk. Uh, a young lad here is waiting for the opportunity for the woman to uh, go. He pinches some sweets and then gets out the shop. And there's still a bloke in there, and you'll see the image getting grainier and grainier. The chap who's walking out now was actually successfully prosecuted for having two bottles of stuff in his pocket. So challenging this preconception that we believe everybody panics, would you now start to imagine that in fact they don't? You know, we, we, we act in some rather strange, rather irrational ways, but escape time becomes everything. So when fire engineers design for means of escape, they do so based on a time analysis. So effectively, you need to get out before the fire gets you. And if you can model that, which is easier to do within a more controlled commercial environment, then it's easier to actually predict it. But we have no idea what is going on inside of your average dwelling. So it relies on your advice actually being passed on at the earliest opportunity. So I, I just want to move on about that. So people can act irrationally. They, they can act in, 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 in weird ways. There was a fire back in the 70s that um, actually Joshua has just said the psychological reactions to different fire alarm scenarios are outlined in the guidebook for the new mandatory test for health and safety and fire. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the the issue of the the way that people are informed, if you walk into a place with a voice actuated alarm system, um, then generally speaking, you know, that that's that that gets you out pretty well and pretty quickly uh, because you're given um, verbal instructions from the alarm system and they, they tend to evacuate an awful lot quicker. I remember doing some fire engineering on Bristol Airport. Well, the building control approval uh, of the fire engineering solution at Bristol Airport. And during the construction phase, they had handbells that literally would turn. So they did a fire brigade one day, and um, they they did a fire they did a they did a fire alarm test one day on the actual site. When they used klaxons, everybody escaped. When they used the handbells nobody actually got up and moved from the place. But if you shout fire, 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 then people will generally speaking get out. I did some work on the RIBA headquarters in um, Bristol. Um, and uh, I was talking to the design architect over there. And I agreed that, you know, there wasn't any point in putting escape signage in. There, there was one way in, there was one way out. All I wanted was emergency lighting. There wasn't any point in putting anything but a manual fire alarm system in. In fact, I'd agreed that they didn't need anything at all because I knew Caroline, who used to be on the reception, was there literally, you know, nine till five every single day, or the enclosure was that small, uh, including a mezzanine, that effectively it didn't really make any difference because people would become aware of the fire uh, pretty damn quickly. And um, having discussed this uh, to some extent with the architect, 
the uh, I went back in to do the completion inspection. They had structural fire protection on the floor. They had a complete smoke protection system in there. They had a running man over the only exit. Uh, you know, they had a fire sign which which demarked the exit. And when I said, well, why did you do that? Because I'd agreed it with the fire officer you didn't need any of that. And, and I was told that the Sparks told that it was against the law to actually do this, you know? And, uh, you know, the, the, the RIBA actually wasted around about probably three or 4,000 quid of your subs actually putting the fire alarm in and emergency lighting that they probably just didn't need. So, you know, listen to the right people at the right time. So we act irrationally. We tend to stand around and watch things develop. You know, we, we, we're, we're, we're curious creatures. So, um, and we respond to peer pressure. You know, the, 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 the example that I used before of the, um, the, the people following me out of the lecture room, and I was taking, as I say, around about 30 or so uh, APC students, it was my fault that they didn't go out the nearest exit because I knew about means of escaping exit fire and I have to take responsibility for that because it was me that was actually in charge of that small group and I should have told them to follow me. And then they would have all been safer had that been a real life fire. So we need to be the ones that are brave enough to actually take control and actually make sure that we're, um, we're actually uh, doing the right thing because we're the experts at the end of the day. People tend to be pre-programmed. That, that Woolworths fire that I started to talk about back in the 70s, there was a psychological study um, of the Woolworths fire. And one guy literally died eating his soup because he just paid for it. And, uh, and, and he was looking at the fire floor and um, he literally was overcome by the effects of the smoke from the furniture. Um, and, and, he, and he wouldn't move and he wouldn't evacuate even when he was told to do so because he paid for his soup and he wanted to do that before he actually escaped. Trying to get people moving inside shop environments and commercial environments can be very, very difficult. And Josh's point about the, the, the choice of fire alarm system with inside, inside commercial property is pretty essential. Although you don't need to do that inside domestic, what you actually need to do is provide something. So inside of these environments, how should we react? This is commercial environments. What, what should you do inside of your um, offices if you see a fire? Well, I suppose those that are trained as fire marshals, um, or in fact, I think everybody at the workplace I'm at has been shown what fire extinguishers to use and all that and where to escape and where to kind of uh, meet. So I suppose you, you would assess it and then make a judgment whether you would fight or flee. Yeah. So we're going to get out and we're going to fight it if it's not safe, if it's safe enough to do so. What else? I Call think if, if, if the alarm the doesn't, if, sorry, if, if, if the fire, fire alarm doesn't, doesn't start, you just shout fire, you um, tell everyone. Yeah, raise the alarm, absolutely. Do you need a fire alarm in a commercial environment? Let's say that the offices that you reside within every single day, do you need a fire alarm in those? An automatic fire alarm? I don't believe you do, it's manual. No, you don't, it's manual. It's manual, so it relies on, on you being informed by your employer to actually raise the alarm on the way out. I mean, we, we could go into commercial property on another session and, and look at the mechanisms and the workings of BS 9999. And, and it says that if you provide automatic detection, and let's face it, most of us do when, when you're designing for, I see it on the plans that come through, most people are actually putting it in. If you put if you put automatic detection in, surely the fire will actually be notified to the occupants quicker and you can expect a faster reaction. Therefore, travel distances should be able to be uh, allowed to increase. And in fact, 9999 actually allows you to do that, but to the tune of around 15% if they're provided with early informed warning to actually evacuate simultaneously. So uh, yeah, you, you got all that right. And in actual fact, we put notices up every single time we leave the building, don't we? You know, the, these notes that you put on the plan that, that it uh, used to provide fire signs. Um, Paul said only needed if the fire was likely to start 
in an area not normally used. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Paul. Absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you're absolutely bang on. But that would be arrived at through risk assessment. Otherwise, it would leak on, you know, it would rely on people actually noticing the fire. That's the approved document way. So I promised you only one slide of regulatory compliance. OK, now this is the slide where we indicate regulatory compliance and, and it's probably teaching us suck eggs because you're probably going to be familiar with this um, to, to a great extent. So the approved document solutions, just to summarise, if you have your typical two storey with a floor level up to um, no more than four and a half metres, it allows you egress windows from the first floor and an open plan arrangement on the ground floor. If you have three storey property, it's the same as the two storey property, uh, plus you need a protected staircase enclosure which has an FD20 door on it. And you need an LD3 alarm system, which means that you need that alarm on the hall stairs and landing. Um, four stories, it's effectively the same, FD20 doors, and um, you need sprinklers, okay? Uh, so can we consider anything else to actually enhance that design? Are there anything else? Is there anything else which is available? But before we get there, I want to just do a quick comparison between our behaviour in commercial property, which we've already seen can be a little irrational, and our behaviour within a domestic environment. So I want you to imagine that this beautiful living room here is, is actually part of a three-storey dwelling. So in other words, it would need to have, um, let me just go back a slide. It would need to be, uh, it would need to have an LD3 alarm system. So it would have a fire alarm on the um, hall, on the stars and on the landings, okay? And um, it would have fire doors. And for the purpose of this exercise, because we're looking at code compliance and absolute perfection, I want you to imagine how you would find out there was a fire inside your house, assuming all the doors were closed, okay? So imagine that you have a three-story house and you have a fire start uh, deep-seated within the couch. Um, how are you gonna know that there's actually a fire in your house? Smoke alarm once it gets to the hallway, I suppose. Yeah. And you're not in there, obviously. Absolutely, Carlos. Yeah. And, and effectively, how long would it take for that smoke alarm to go off? If it was I, 20 seconds. <laughs> if the door wasn't open, yeah. Uh, but we haven't got a detector inside this room. Yeah. So it's going to take 20 minutes, isn't it? If, if the door complies to the extent that we want. So your escape time is actually around about 10 minutes. It's the time it takes for the smoke to leak into the staircase enclosure to inform you of a fire. I would suggest inside this particular room, you're probably going to know a little bit faster than that. So how are you going to know? Um, there's a smoke detector um, for the open fire. Mm, there's a carbon yeah. monoxide detector for the open yeah. fire, but there's no requirement for it to be a detection system, so to speak. Mm. And it, it's yeah. unlikely that it would provide audibility through two doors or through a floor which is compliant to Part E. So it's a good point, absolutely. But yeah, it, it, it would probably, it, it probably would set off some sort of alarm. Um, is there any other way that you think you probably know prior to the smoke detection going off within the hallway that, that you had a fire in the room? Could be potentially, uh, you know, um, made aware by a neighbour, or if you have a pet, or something like that, potentially. Yeah, could be pets, absolutely. Yeah, I want you to think a little bit out of box, out the box. What what have we got? I mean, we've got decoration here. We tend to concentrate on on building features. So, what have we got around there that would maybe fail a little bit quicker than you would expect? Light fittings on the soffit, you know, there might be a hole into the the floor above and you may get smoke coming through and things like that. Would the glass break? That's interesting. Which glass? The glass on the ceiling light. Uh, the glass tends to break at around about 250 degrees C. Okay. Oh. Um, so maybe, yeah. maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Um, if you have a slow developing fire, 
I mean, obviously there's a there's an open fireplace there. What about the thing that's hanging over the um, over the fireplace? You've got a lovely picture there, haven't you? Which is probably on a piece of string. And pieces of string aren't known for their fire resistance. So that, that piece of string would probably fail and that very heavy frame would clatter down onto that uh, carriage clock that you've had since you were married. And, you know, you've been looking for an excuse to get rid of it. Uh, and, and, and you're going to end up with a glass or you're going to end up with a clatter downstairs. So you know that there's something going on. But what would you assume that to be? If you heard glass smashing down below, Somebody an breaking. intruder. <laughs> Absolutely, you'd, you'd assume it was a, a burglar. And the reason for the guy on the right is that I, I, you know, we tend to go back to our base instinct. And you see this repeated in the press, particularly after domestic fires, which you reported in part, but you never really sort of hear the outcomes of them. What Dad actually normally does is he has this innate need to protect his family. And he goes zipping down the staircase enclosure with anything that he can grab. And he opens the door to the living room and the fire, due to the oxygen content being increased, will flash into the staircase enclosure. And he'll lose his eyebrows, but he'll still be able to remain a living. But the chances of that fire being past 150 degrees through which he will not be able to get up towards his sleeping children upstairs, he could have the effect of killing his children and spoiling the staircase enclosure. Yeah. And this is a code compliant situation, remember. And we assume that because it complies with the building regulations, everything's okay. And, and, and this is code compliant, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So just to give you a little bit of food for thought, just because it complies with the building regulations does not mean that it's safe. So my, my reason for mentioning this is that what provides you of certainty in any situation is to provide a better standard of domestic fire alarm system, okay? So rather than just doing a hall stairs and landing system and creating the LD3 compliance model, why on earth don't we make it habitual to actually give a certainty of fires actually occurring by putting in LD2 every single time we design a house. You know, how much would it actually, how much would it actually add to the build? Every I suppose, single... I suppose if it was a one-off client, Andy, they probably would. Whereas if it was a, a big developer, say Barrett's or Davidson's, and they've got, I don't know, 60 plots on 20 sites, and they decide to do this, they're going to look at the cost uplift, aren't they? And they're going to get, well, we don't need to do it, so we're not going to do it. Yeah. It's that mental Value engineering at its best, isn't it? Yeah. Forget enhanced fire safety systems. It's just value engineering. That yeah. word that since Grenfell has become absolutely evil. So it's uh, you, you're right, and uh, and I think uh, on those type of situations, we need to be a little bit more persuasive towards actually enhancing the protection, and maybe taking a little bit of time to actually point them in directions of um, you know press attention that that, that occur and accuse dads of arson. When in actual fact, all they've done is tried to protect their family in the best way that they possibly can. There was a chap who was an Asian guy in the um, southeast of England a few years ago, and he was absolutely slated by the press for killing his family. When you actually look at the cause of the fire, what he was actually trying to do was defend the family against an intruder. And, um, you know, this came out in the inquiry to that particular fire, and it's a repeating theme. Every single time you, you hear of something, you know, people always assume that it's arson caused by the person that investigated the fire first. And building regulation compliance, in my humble opinion, doesn't really mean enhanced um, fire protection. Building regulations are a very minimum standard and um, approved document compliance is only that. So we should strive to make sure that we provide better detection systems. And, and at that point, I'm going to kind of move on to give you a few options as to how you can use this. But the forerunner of everything is that whenever you use these options, you need better detection. It'll allow you more freedom, but you need better detection. So the first of which I'm gonna go through today is sprinklers for open plan living. When, when we saw the Christmas tree fire before, we decided that it was very smoky, it would be very ineffective, but it will allow you open plan uh, layouts, but the approved document suggests 
and it's absolutely necessary to put structural fire uh, prevention between the ground and the first floor. It doesn't necessarily need to be via a protected enclosure, and it is listed inside volume one of approved document B as a prescriptive solution. So um, let's just have a look at and see how these sprinkler systems actually work. So um, th this little bulb here, for those of you that don't know, is filled with a, a liquid, which at around about, depending on the type of bulb and the color of the liquid, at around about 59 or 69 degrees will burst. And then there's a little mechanism here that opens like a tap. This thing here is, is a deflector, which then spins, depending on the water pressure, and this one's pretty pathetic, I must admit, um, and, then, and then actually uh, provide you with a single layer, okay? And it's the, the, the background noise of the, um, the fire brigade coming just shows you how fast this will work by comparison. Sprinklers are the only thing that will actually um, save a person potentially if, if it goes off in the room of origin and it's a relatively low fire load, okay? So that's how a sprinkler works. They've suffered some quite bad press because I remember Peter Lilly when he was the heritage secretary after the Windsor fire saying, oh, thank goodness the place wasn't sprinkling. Because I think that, that people have the assumption that it isn't this single bulb that goes off underneath the, the, underneath the heat of the flames. And the chances are, that, that fire was caused by a discarded cigarette in Windsor, they think. And it probably would have been controlled by one or two heads. And the, the fire brigade would have gone in and actually done a, a, done a mop up exercise and maybe taken a little bit of corn sing off just to make sure that it hadn't spread. And that would have been it. But instead they put thousands and thousands and thousands of liters of water onto that fire and destroyed the place. A hell of a lot more than had the building actually been sprinkled. Now, obviously, we've seen sprinklers creep in for domestic places above 11 metres, you know, domestic uh, premises which are being created in 11 metres for any generally to perform. So it's, uh, it, it's something which is a solution. I also want to mention the virtues of misting systems today, because the difference between a good misting system and a sprinkler system is if you think about the fire triangle and the way the fire triangle works, so we've got heat, oxygen, and fuel, what a, what a, what a sprinkler system will do is it will actually squirt water at the fire and remove the heat from it. What a misting system will do is actually have smothering, smothering effects to actually remove some of the oxygen from the flames, okay? That smothers the fuel. Uh, it does remove the heat at the same time, and it will enhance the fire detection. Now this, this experiment undertaken by Derby Fire um, is inside of a cupboard. You can hear that you have the alarm going um, and it's delivering 12 liters per minute um, and, and we'll see the effects of the, the misting system. So it, you can see that it, it, it's um, no less effective than sprinklers. Arguably, in my opinion, misting heads are an awful lot better. And they're innovating quicker than the British standards can actually evolve. You know, the auto mist systems cannot comply with the British standards because they're innovating to allow um, sort of passive infrared detection to actually direct the, uh, the jets over the actual fuel. Just because something doesn't comply with the British standard, please don't rule it out when you're actually creating features. You know, go to the building control body that you're using and make sure that you discuss with them um, maybe the best systems that are going to be available to actually enhance and provide the design features that you want. If you do have open plan living, some building control bodies, us included, will allow you to probably not have the fire door or the, the structural separation between the ground floor and the first floor 
Okay. Now, the reason we do this is because when we consider the tenability limits, you know, the, the misting head has a slightly scrubbing effect on the toxicity of the gas that comes off the fire and will, generally speaking, make it less toxic to occupants. It obviously has, on a steady growing fire, the ability to cool the fire to under 150 degrees fairly quickly. It won't overcome a Christmas tree fire any more than a sprinkler head will, which is why if you're going to adopt these solutions, it's probably pretty essential that you do it. Um, and also the, the other thing that you will not be able to get over is the reason that you need to do your fire um, evacuation tests inside your property blindfolded is because the smoke will be just as black okay so if you're going to do this you need to be able to pass this information on to your clients the the um most of the misting systems are actually set up by combined heat and smoke protection that you actually see now there are those available that work on a quartzoid bulb you know that's similar to a uh, sprinkler system uh, it's just a different head design, generally speaking, but they're still misting heads. But the majority that you see inside domestic enclosures look something similar to that. You have to be extremely careful where you put wall mounted heads because obviously it can be extremely easy to cover them up with wardrobes, with units and what have you. And it is when you when you employ the design of these things, then they will actually tell you that the um, the system is um, uh, you know, they, they'll, they'll suggest where you actually need to mount it. Um, you need to be particularly careful where you mount it. The very first one that I saw, I ended up getting stripped and redone because they put it right behind where the curtains were going to be. So, um, you know, you need to be particularly careful where you actually put the heads and they'll design the best place for you when you actually go to them and consult. The system on the right hand side of the images that you can see is the plumist system which fits to the underside of a kitchen tap and it can allow you some open plan arrangements they tend to sit on their own wireless detection system which is battery operated with backup um, and, uh, and 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 i will actually just sort of put a fine mist over the kitchen and um, you can see there there's an awful lot of anecdotal videos on youtube that you can watch to actually see these the other thing I'm going to show you today is, is this lovely video from the 1970s, okay? And what I'd like you to watch is this door here. I'd like you to imagine that this is a fully code compliant FD30 door, okay? Or FD20 door, fully code compliant in its normal state of, of closure, okay? Because there is no requirement to have a, a, have a closing device on these doors anymore. So I want you to imagine that this is the um full fully rated fire door enclosure and what we have here is a perfectly normal georgian door now i'm going to just allow the advert to run but i want you to look at the panel on this door okay just to see the effects of the fire when you when you actually watch the video and it's an old cheesy 1970s video i just wish we'd see more of them now both these rooms are on fire the closed door bottles up the fumes and heat. If the closed door were open, the heat and fumes by now could be strong enough to kill you. The closed door held the fire back for 20 minutes. Time for your family to escape. So shut all doors every night. Earn yourself 20 minutes. You never know when you may need them. Did you see the blistering on the door? You know, uh, but but it didn't fail, did it? It failed around the top head of the actual door. If you'd maybe considered putting a an intumescent um, stick on strip with a, a cold smoke seal around that door, could it be said to give you the 10 minutes fire resistance that you require, which is the benchmark standard for what the approved document looks for? If you consider that we have structural integrity around that door of half an hour and the smoke leaks within um 20 minutes through the door to set off the fire alarms if you provide more certainty by putting better detection inside there okay then what you actually end up with is um is a situation where you where you you become fully aware that there is actually a fire quicker you can enhance the protection on the door 
If the panels are in poor condition, then there are materials available such as seal master fire face, uh, which is like a two millimeter uh, stick on panel, which they can match in with the door or you can paint them or whatever that fits on each panel, each panel door. As long as the door is sort of 35 millimeters thick, you'll probably be able to upgrade that to an FD20 standard and produce a fire certificate for you. Um, you need to consider both sides of the door now inside domestic situations because obviously, obviously you need to certify everything to make sure that it correlates with its fire test data. Um, but maybe just doing nothing to the door is actually better than the fire door. You know, I said that the door on the right hand side was actually the code compliant solution. And, and which environment would you rather live in? It's, it's a moot point really, isn't it? But it's pretty obvious that, you know, if you're behind the shut door, you're fine. If you're not, you're not. <laughs> and the chances are, you know, it, 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 it's bad if it's shut, it's bad if it isn't. But if you go LD2 alarm system, I would much rather be in a place with a three story place with no fire doors, knowing that I had linked fire detection that was going to provide me the certainty of the fire. So it's all about the approach that you take to the Andy, you know, with the, the smoke seal comment that you made, uh, I went to view a property that a friend had bought the other week and they were looking at potentially doing a bit of an extension. And they, they bought it, they decorated everything downstairs. The, you know, the kitchen door had the smoke seals within the door frame. And I said, you, you've painted directly over those. And they went, yeah, well, it was looking a bit tired. I said, well, they will no longer work. You know, they're designed to not have that coating, that coating will restrict it. So they had no idea what they were in the frame to be honest and i think you know that probably is echoed by a lot of people that are not in our industry they won't know what it is they won't know the purpose of it yeah and, and even you, you you've just mentioned a really good point man. i mean the, the other thing is if you see these things inside a domestic environment the way that we actually train our surveyors to inspect buildings if they go out and they see an ld3 alarm system in other words the hall stairs and landing alarms then builders believe that they're actually providing a better level of um, fire prevention if they actually incorporate cold smoke seals and intermittent structure doors. But how on earth are you ever going to know that you've actually got a fire inside the house at all? So we train our inspectors that if they see those sort of situations, then we, we hack the door to bits with a Stanley knife to get rid of the fire seal because the fire seal will prevent the action which is intended inside the inside that to, to actually, uh, you know, we, we, won't, we, we don't want the seal on there because that effectively makes it a 30-30 door. In other words, as the fire breaks out, so too does the door collapse out of its structural opening. You're left with no time to escape whatsoever. But you're absolutely right, Nick. I mean, inside domestic environments, um, is there really a need for it? Or, or do you just stick it on and make sure that, I mean, there's, there's an initiative, I'm, I'm, I'm in a meeting uh, next week about something called the building passport. And what they're actually looking to do is build up a property pack, which has all of your information on it. It has all of our information on it. You know, the initial notice, the final certificate, if it was a local authority, the, the full plans application, the building notice, the plan check, the final, uh, the, the completion certificate from the local authority to actually have it all in one place. So at least it's available for the lifetime of the occupants of that building to actually know what the maintenance requirements are on their homes. Um, maybe that's the way that we should be going to, to, to stand the chance of our solutions actually being available to ours, uh, to all I should say, and making sure that they have all that information available not just the colour of their paint inside the property pack. You need the meaningful stuff like, you know, there's an intermittent strip and cold smoke seal up here on a reason. Don't paint it. And if you do paint it, you know, it costs 16 quid a set down from Wix or whatever. You know, they're not difficult to replace, are they? So, yeah, it's about increasing education. But in, to do that, I think we, we arguably need to start feeding into these systems for free. Um, and, you know, it's a single payment of around about 60 quid for a lifetime of, of registration and subsequent occupants. And, and everybody would have all of our information inside that building safety passport pack. So not a bad idea, really. But I've got to find out more details from it because it's not my initiative in next week. Um, and, and if it, it's there, then maybe we can pass that information on the next session, if you have a spare. 
So um, the, the next solution is domestic fire shutters. And um, this is the same enclosure. I'm not too sure whether you can see my map. You'll notice that up in the up in the lintel arrangements here, you'll see a track that runs down through there. This this fire shutter is around about two millimeters thick, and it's made of fabric. Okay. Um, it, it has structural and it has uh, integrity, and it will allow you to separate off enclosures that are a little bit tight. What we tend to like seeing as building control bodies, if you use fire shutters to provide enhanced protection, is that generally speaking, if it's a habitable room that it actually blocks off, then we want to see it fitted with a clutch. We want to see it with some sort of battery backup um, button out of which people can escape underneath before it comes back down. OK, uh, we want to see it. So it, it's normally interrupting sort of design features that are unlikely to have furniture such as dining room chairs actually put it underneath it one of the most frustrating feelings i get every single time i go on holiday is to go into bristol airport and realize that the sunglasses rack is right underneath the spire shutter every single time i go in there and and there's a few times i've been moved to say you think that that's the fire shutter there don't you you really ought to move it across because i lecture about this stuff all the time and it would be wrong for me to just walk through and ignore it so i become a, one of those people that that actually complains to the concessionaire owners to, to move the rack of sunglasses um but it, it, it is absolutely true so I'm going to close it there. The reason why I haven't put smoke ventilation systems that can work with sprinklers and what have you inside of a staircase enclosure. So if you put automatic opening vents inside of a staircase enclosure, this will enhance the um, this will enhance, but it tends to go coupled with one of these solutions, whether it be sprinklers, whether it be mist, and it works extremely well to vent in exactly the same way as you would do a domestic. Um, block of flats, for instance, with a single staircase. It can work with enhanced detection and it would just open and it would certainly maintain the tenability conditions for longer. Uh, right, what I'd like you to do is remember information for your clients and, and I'm gonna draw a, a, you know, it's a simple analogy here. It's just like regulation 38 in commercial property. And I do find that the take up of regulation 38 poor. Architects are obviously, sometimes quite shocked when we ask them for confirmation that they pass their design assumptions on to their clients. But there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing this to allow more design freedom to provide the clients with what we actually want, provide them with better information about how the building's actually designed. And if you can't do it because of insurance restrictions, then hire somebody that does. You know, we're just about to see introduced, particularly around London, for those of you that work within the London area, gateway one of the Fire Safety Act actually being uh, coming into place where you actually have to do a fire statement that's going to keep fire consultants, particularly in smaller architectural design firms, because of their insurance restrictions these days, very, very, very much occupied for a long time. So get them to do it at the same time. And, and be the ones to facilitate that conversation with the fire engineer, the fire risk assessor, whatever it may be, um, and, and actually make sure that you provide uh, information about keeping areas clear, the, the importance of checking the um, smoke alarms. You know, if you've got an extinguisher, where to put it, where not to put it. I can't remember the amount of fire um blankets that i've actually seen positioned directly over cookers so you know these things actually happen uh teach your kids to be careful and actually practice means of escape with them i do with mine i know exactly where they're going to be if there's a fire you know they're either going to be leaping out of my little bungalow windows onto the roof of my car like starsky and hutch or they're going to be coming and finding me depending on where they are in the house um and, and make sure they prepare their plan and know how to get themselves and everybody else out of that place. And it's just going back to fundamentals, being less reliant on the approved document solutions, because I would argue that if, if it works perfectly, still not all that safe. So it's, um, I'll just close by saying that uh, JHA are a national company. This depicts the, the postcodes in which we work for each of our regions. We have a number of regions up and down the country. 
and um, and we're here to help. We have people everywhere that can stomp around and help you actually provide um, a, a reactive and planned building control service. We do lots and lots of these sessions. If your company is certainly large enough, we'll be happy to come in and provide you with any help. JHA is actually just embarking on a number of um, sessions to do with the um, future home standard, which we're we'll obviously see introduced this time next year. And um, perhaps we could come and talk to the group about it if you'll have us back. Uh, I know that Steve, I, and Jen, who are the, tend to be the sort of lecturers that, that stop around the country doing these sort of sessions. And it's far more pleasant and comfortable for us to actually stand in front of you and do these things. I find that they're an awful lot more interactive. Um, so I'll just close by putting Lindsay's details up. She's the regional manager that's based actually within Nottingham. If you do have any building control needs with which she can help, then email her. She'll be happy to get a quote across to you. If you need seminars, again, just contact her and you'll see my details at the front of the, front of the slides as well. So uh, I'll just open it up to uh, questions before I sign off, but I just want to say thanks very much for having me. And hopefully that's been informative, not too lectury, but giving you something to think about so you can enhance the value that you provide to your clients and uh, using innovative methods. But if you do so, for God's sake, pass on the information to your clients uh, so they can pass it on to their end users. Thanks very much for listening. I'll just open it up for questions. Thanks, Andy. No uh, problem. Just have a quick look in the chat. Yeah, if you, if you don't want to actually ask the question in person, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, I had a question for you, Andy, actually. Recently, oh. we um, it's on a commercial office project, actually, but we, we'd specified a fire curtain um, between a reception area and the, the fire escape stair one of two uh, over a four-story building mm -hmm. and um, the, the the fire officer on that was very reluctant for us to have it he wanted us to replace it with a wall and have a door um, the reason being he was talking about the integrity and insulation um, and I had to do a bit of research into it but I found that actually there was a, a uh, an update to the BS that actually Instead of having it classified as separate, it was classified as one. I just wondered whether you could kind of give a bit of a uh, an insight into that with regards to fire curtains, because obviously, if, if the integrity is is not as great as the uh, insulation, then it, it kind of all becomes undone anyway. You know, how actually. many how many stars did you have within the building then? So we had two, but we we worked it out so it, it would work with one if one was out of action. And you had the distances to be able to cope with that, so you'd effectively exclude one. I mean, fires don't start in two places at once. So, yeah. you know, if you have more stars within a building, I would say that I'm not too fussed about the integrity in it on some smoke leaks. Um, as long as you have, as long as you're using a fire, um, you know, a, a proper certified fire curtain at the end of the day or shutter, whatever it happens to be, it doesn't really matter because you've always got somewhere else to go. Mm. Um, what you've got to be very careful of is that if somebody starts to escape and sees that smoke is leaking, they need to have the staircase width to go back up and across to the other staircase. Yeah. But the insulation rating would be there. So it really comes down to that reasonable inadequacy, the, the reasonableness and adequacy of their fire risk assessment. You will have heard Steve talk last February, for those that attended, about this constant reference within the building regulations to it being reasonable and adequate. Mm -hmm. And it really does come down to the management and the risk assessment of that property. Um, if it was the only means of escape route, yeah, the integrity is a problem. If it isn't, then as long as you can enhance the information that's provided to people and, and make the signage better and make the means of escape more intuitive with plenty of practice, with a better managed environment, there's no reason you can't have it inside that environment. The chances are, if you have something that affects the other staircase enclosure, it doesn't matter what's on the stair. But if there's something there, then your fire marshals would literally send them to the other staircase enclosure, wouldn't they? So I would suggest that's a reasonable and adequate judgment call I mean, inside the risk assessment. It was confusing because it was saying that the integrity of the curtain was 90 minutes, but the insulation was only 60. But therefore, if the insulation is only 60, it won't be there in 90 minutes. 
You know what I mean? So that was the kind of, when I read the BS update, it all started to fall into place that they're, they're both one in the same. You yeah. know, How many stories did this place have? Uh, only four. So, and they were, they were pressing in 60 minutes. I would suggest that the fires probably destroyed most of the features on the ceiling before that time, if it was a tender floor. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the chances are 60 minutes integrity. Let's yeah. not be too, I mean, I, I, I took somebody for our ICS. I, I was chairing an RICS APC interview and I was being told that they stopped work on a job because a single story school with a bit of a turret where there was a classroom, didn't have 60 minutes fire resistance. They hadn't got this sort of, you know, this time-based assessment that engineers look at to actually justify how long it's actually going to take to escape. The chances are you're going to be out of that building completely evacuated within 10 minutes of fire alarms go off on you. So, I mean, 60 minutes integrity in a four-story building, I'd be quite happy with that. Yeah. It's all about escape time and, and kind of, you know, but we, we do get the guys that have spent a, um, you know, a, a course or two in Morton in the Marsh and learned what the book says. And we do need to relate that back to managed practice, I think. So, we, you know, that I think it's always best if you can kind of, you know, look at the consultation process in a bit of a circle and involve the clients and get their risk assessment. Up front. So they can then provide comfort to the uh, fire brigade. Well, themselves principally, because the fire brigade will only look at it posthumously yeah, um, yeah. And, and question that risk assessment. So it's just getting them involved as quickly as possibly can. Really, uh, we have a question from Gil in the chat. Um, is it the case that sprinklers need a tank, but mist systems can be direct mains fed, or is that too simplistic? It is a little bit simplistic. It really depends on the mains pressure that's available. So, I mean, obviously what you need to do is get an indication of that. Uh, you can run misting systems from a pressurized cylinder, which is a similar size to a domestic uh, unvented hot water cylinder, a couple of hundred liters, only nearly needs to run for the period during the means of escape of the actual fire. And, and sprinklers, you can run it from the mains, but it does need a little bit more pressure so do get advice of the actual sprinklers. I hope that answers your question, Gil. Um, is there any from the NDSA committee at all? I know that we've got Josh, Sarah, and Paul's in the background as well somewhere. It might help stir on any, any others in the meeting. Um, no, I just wanted to say, Andy, thank you very much for the presentation. It definitely uh, food for thought. And all I can think about now is just uh, after this, walking around the house and making sure that I actually know from where to escape um, and definitely will, um, uh, you know, affect how um, I think about um, fire um, when I design um, extensions or work on dwellings. So thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed it. No, you're welcome. Thanks very much for having me. As, as I say, I, I enjoy these sessions. We tend to get very blinkered in our slavery to the approved documents and our slavery to the British standards that we don't necessarily think about the, the psychological effects and how we actually sort of do this and it, it gives us another interesting lilt as to how we can consider the information that we're almost kind of professionally duty bound to give to people um you know if it, and, and also approve you know assuming that what we create every day to those documents is actually safe and it's questionable. It depends on it depends on proper use, doesn't it? And and and, and it still it still depends on on a management of the of the environment that the approved documents just assume that you're using, and um, we know that not to be the case, don't we? Yeah. But no, you're welcome, Sarah. Thanks very much. Thanks for saying, thanks for being the one for volunteering as well. But as I say, it's an unforgiving exercise. This in such a highly interactive seminar. I'd much rather be stood in front of you, seeing the whites of your eyes and getting you all involved. <laughs> well, yes, I think hopefully, uh, if if all goes well, then um, the next one and, and hopefully our, our other events uh, we've got planned for the autumn will begin to be more um, uh, personable, shall we say, yeah. <laughs> than digital. Um, uh, but yes, no, it's been great to, to have you along again and um, I hope everyone found that informative. Great stuff. Thanks very much, everybody. And thanks for having thanks, me. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, no problem at all. See you all at our next event. Thank Great you, Anton. Stuff. Thank you.
if do you get feedback to these events guys because if you do have any constructive feedback please just pop it through to me i mean we're always looking for methods to improve if you want us to cover different areas then just let us know we'll we'll do whatever we need we will do and yeah. uh, i'll be in touch and we can talk about potentially another event maybe in six months time great stuff thanks very much i'll Good. make sure i got my pants on for the next one <laughs> <laughs> thanks andy thanks very much all the best Cheers. thank bye -bye. you bye